<laughs> okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, okay. Um, I'd like to call this meeting of the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee uh, Tuesday, December 12th, 2023 at 10 a.m. to order. Um, I will now read the script for remotely conducted meetings. Good morning. This open meeting of the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee is convening by video conference pursuant to Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. This meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that other people may be able to um, see you and take care not to share your device's screen. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please silence all phones and devices. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation, participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For items with public comment, after members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment to those members of the public that have joined the meeting via Zoom. Members of the public who wish to speak must state their names and be acknowledged by and speak through the chair. Use the raise the hand feature in Zoom to indicate that you'd like to offer a comment. The chair will call on those who have raised their hands in the order that they were raised. All questions should be directed to the chair. If you're not able to participate in the remote meeting, you may also submit comments to the Coastal Resilience Coordinator, Leah Hill, and request that they be read into the meeting record. Her email is lhill at nantucket-ma.gov. Confirming member access. I am Peter Brace, Chair of the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, Please respond in the affirmative. Okay. Doug Rose. Here. Jen Carberg. Here. Gary Beller. Here. Sarah Boyce. Here. Rachel Freeman. Here. Matt Fee. Here. And the chair is here. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, Vince Murphy. Here. Okay. Anticipated speakers on the agenda, uh, please respond in the affirmative. Um, we have, um, I guess, uh, Amy Cohane. Amy Cohane, you're you're on mute. Amy, you there? Okay, never mind. Um, and uh, Sunny Daly. Here. Okay, great. All right. So finally, each vote taken in the meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. Um, so we'll now take public comment. Um, public comment is for any um, uh, issue or item not on the agenda. Um, and so we kind of planned, um, Leah and I did, to have. Um, Kim Starbuck of Urban Harbors Institute, um, the, the consultant that is doing our Harbor Plan update um, with the Harbor Plan Update Committee, uh, speak to us just a little bit briefly about how um, she anticipates um, the Harbor Plan Update Committee and Urban Harbors uh, melding um, the Coastal Resilience Plan with um, the update. So why don't you go ahead, Kim, and introduce yourself and speak your piece. Great, thank you for having me. Um, so uh, as Peter noted, I'm Kim Starbuck. I work at the Urban Harbors Institute. I've been working closely with Alan, who's also on the call here. Um, Alan's been helping uh, specifically with um, looking at coastal resiliency issues and how to incorporate those into the Harbor Plan. And I know a number of you from some different, um, different engagements and some have helped with this Harbor Plan. Um, so good to see all of you. And uh, so we've been working on the Harbor Plan update now for um, pretty much close to a year. We've been doing a lot of public engagement. Uh, some of you may have come to um, some of the meetings that we've had. And right now we're in the writing stage of developing the Harbor Plan. And um, one of the big um, items that we have come up with is that um, 
you know, you guys have such an in-depth coastal resiliency plan already, how to include coastal resiliency in the harbor plan without it being um, duplicative, with, without, you know, trying to reinvent the wheel, but also making sure that we're noting that the plan exists and um, that it has a lot of important recommendations in it. And um, so right now we're trying to, to craft that. And, um, you know, I think right now, obviously, we, we definitely don't have enough time um, to really tackle that issue in full, but that's something that we're going to want to be working with you all with in the next month or two to really start to dig into, you know, how can we um, capture what was in the Coastal Resiliency Plan without um, making it a duplicative process. Uh, one thing we've we've thought about is looking specifically at our harbor area, um, our harbor plan area, which includes Nantucket Harbor and Mattaquet Harbor. So we have um, boundaries that we've developed and looking specifically at those two areas and then looking at what projects have been identified as needs in those areas. And then kind of looking a little bit further into that and seeing um, what progress has been made with those, um, you know, how, basically how can the Harbor Plan help you all move some of these big items forward? Um, so that's, that's one way we've kind of thought internally about tackling it, but um, we definitely, you know, I don't know if now is the right time to open things up to your feedback, but, um, you know, it's something I think we're going to, we're going to talk with Peter a little bit later in the week about some more of this and um, continue engaging you guys. And Alan, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add. No, uh, Kim, I think you did a great job summarizing uh, mm -hmm. kind of where the Harbor Plan uh, is and how how we we do want uh, the Harbor Plan as well as the Coastal Resilience Plan to, to work synergistically. Uh, so much work has been done and uh, we do not want that to be forgotten uh, in in kind of in, in a kind of in an appendix somewhere. And so, uh, so, so thank you for all your help today, uh, and we look forward to working with you in the future. You all said yes, yes. So yeah, we can, um, right now it's probably not the right time to get feedback on all of that, but I can talk to you a little bit more about it, Peter, at the, the end of the week, and then we can see what's the best way to really engage this, this group to make sure we're, um, you know, working with all of you to figure out how to best include this. So I agree with Kim. I, I agree that we don't go and spend 20 minutes talking about this because she's just introducing this now. I see Sarah's hand up and I'm going to let her talk in a minute. But um, the way Lee and I kind of worked it out would be that um, there'll be a meeting this week that I'll be in attendance at um, representing the board. I'm sorry, the committee. And then in, um, in January, um, we hope to organize a meeting where all, all committee members will be able to join this meeting and provide input um, to this, giving all of us time to think about it. So um, with that in mind, Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Peter. I think that's what I was gonna say. I think I'm kind of dismayed that we're talking about this as part of public comment because it's not a full agenda item. And I think this is a real opportunity for our group to fully engage with the Harbor Plan group, um, you know, discuss our like suggestions, concerns, or just like where, how we think this should work. And um, I honestly was like surprised that I went back to the agenda because I was like, did I miss something? Because I didn't feel prepared for this. Um, so I appreciate, um, you know, Kim and Alan that you guys are here today, but to Peter and Leah and Vince, I really think this needs to be a full agenda item that we can fully engage and talk to you guys and have a back and forth because I think it's really important. And I wouldn't want it to be just kind of a, not that this is a throwaway, but that we don't normally comment on public comment. So I think I just, you know, that was my two cents. So I'm glad to hear that we'll be, I, I guess my other kind of comment is I don't want it to go too far in the process before we're asked to, have this discussion again. Um, I think that if we wait too long um, as a group, then it's kind of like we're just commenting on the things that have already been done. It would be really nice to kind of be collaborative as if possible. Thanks. Okay, Sarah, just to, so you understand how this came together, um, Leah and I get together on Monday or Tuesday prior to this meeting, um, prior to our meetings and, and 
uh, come up with our agenda. Um, Kim only contacted me like, um, you know, last week on Friday. Mm -hmm. And they had only hatched this idea at the end of last week. So it's not some big conspiracy. We just didn't know about it to create the, <laughs> no, it, it, it's all right. We didn't know about it to put it on the agenda. Believe believe you me, if we'd known about it, this would be an agenda item today. Doing it in public comment was the only way we could get her to initially tell us about it and set this in motion. And this is happening now um, um, in the Harbor Plan update process because this is where this is when it came up in the process of Urban Harbors working on the first draft. So this is as early as either of our committees can be getting to it. And so what I was proposing was as soon as we can in like within the first two weeks of 2024, we'll be getting together. We'll have an agenda item. Urban Harbors, um, we meet twice a week. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, the Harbor Plan Committee, we meet twice a month and um, that'll be an agenda item. And I will um, make sure that everybody gets the link and everybody can attend the meeting. So. Okay. It, 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 it's not the greatest conditions to have it on under public comment, but at least we got to hear Kim and Alan speak on it. Okay, great. Um, thanks, great. Kim. Yeah, thanks, thank Alan. you guys for having us and looking forward to talking more in, in the new year. Okay, we're going to have thank, a discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Um, discussion and update on the offshore wind grant opportunities. Uh, by Sunny Daly, Executive Director for the Community Foundation for Nantucket. Um, go ahead, Sunny. Sorry, I see Doug has his hand raised. Doug. Yeah, I just was curious if there was any other public comment. That's all. Thanks. I waited and there wasn't. So, and we're going to have public comment after every item. So, um, go ahead, Sunny. Great. So, uh, the Offshore Wind Community Fund Grant is on the Nantucket Community Foundation's website. So if you're looking for this information and you want to review it, it's on cfnan.org under the Receive tab. And if you go to that, there is on the left-hand side an item that says Nantucket Offshore Wind Community Fund Grant. And you can scroll through that. Um, I'm going to review that information with you as just kind of an overview of what to expect uh, from grant applications, how the process works, uh, really, the Community Foundation was brought in to provide this grant making service. We are not part of the history of what got us to this point. We are simply holding the funds in order to grant them out. So I think that's a, a major piece for people to understand. Um, there is a committee that will be reviewing all of the applications, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail, but that committee is not a Community Foundation board nor is it a community foundation arm. Um, again, all our responsibility is, is to help impl implement this grant making cycle. So if you go to the website, you will see there are the criteria outlined for the offshore wind community fund grant. Um, and those bigger sort of goals of this grant money is to provide and promote renewable energy development to combat the effects of global climate change, to enhance coastal resiliency, and to protect, restore, and preserve cultural and historical resources. In addition, there are restrictions on the scope of activities that the fund can support. So there will not be grants awarded for unrestricted general operating expenses, umbrella funding organizations, capital campaigns, lobbying, um, nor will there be grants to individuals. So that, when people look at it, kind of um, have their own ideas of what that means. If you go further into the application itself, I think it really makes it clear what the grants are looking for. Um, the application is really looking for grants on project-based um, initiatives. So something that has sort of all the pieces in place to be put into motion. Um, so the application will kind of walk you through that. And I think the hardest thing for people to kind of get their head around is, how do I fill this out if I am working with a town department or board or commission? And really the best thing that I can say not being a town employee is try to get some guidance from department heads, from committees, kind of having a collaborative effort where you get a lot of buy-in from the players 
is going to make a much better grant application than somebody that's trying to go at it alone. And I know that that means different things to different people, but really permitting, um, you know, some sort of approval from committee heads, department heads, some sort of collaborative effort where there is a, a good possibility the project will get off the ground. The other thing with this is there's been some discussion about, um, we understand that programs or projects like this could be a long project, right? So something that's not going to be accomplished in a one year time frame. The goal is really to be able to award a grant that has a very firm timeline outlined with a strong probability of that timeline being met. And the goal would be a one year turnaround. Now, again, we know that not every program is gonna have a one year um, timeline to it, but again, it really needs to be mapped out clearly. What is the expectation? What are the hurdles? What are the green lights that are already in place? Um, because again, the, there is not like a reimbursement model. It will be a grant that goes out and then there'll be a six month report and a one year report. Um, so the committee is really trying to be mindful about getting those programs that are really ready to roll up and going and not really trying to start from ground zero and having little baby steps that aren't going to accomplish projects in a, in a quick amount of time. So the other thing that people have had questions about is how much money is there? Um, there is a lot of money, but it will not all be awarded out in the first grant cycle. So in combination, there is about $2 million that is being held and it's being divided into different categories. A portion of that money is set aside for town projects only. A, a sector of money is set aside for only Nantucket Preservation Trust projects. And then the biggest um, amount of money is set up, uh, aside for community initiatives. And this is something that, um, you know, sort of loosely defined the committee will sort of figure out what makes the most sense, what sort of stream of funding will it go to. But again, their goal is not to award $2 million in one year, but to really make progress on the projects that are ready to go and then help those projects that come forward and, and perhaps don't have all the pieces in place, figure out what would be a stronger application moving forward and therefore perhaps a stronger um, grant uh, probability moving forward. So since this is the first go round of this, it's understandable that there's going to be a learning curve for everybody. So we expect applications or applicants to have questions. That's what the foundation is here for. We're happy to walk you through any questions that you have on the application. I do anticipate again, because this is the first grant cycle that the advisory committee will have further questions. Um, we are talking right now about actually interviewing all the applicants that have strong applications to sort of flesh out um, the stories a little bit uh, in more detail. At the foundation, having run grant cycles, we know that it's one thing to write it on a piece of paper. It's a whole other thing to be able to tell the entire story of the project. And that's why we really think the interview process is very valuable. Um, the committee is still kind of figuring out what that's going to look like. We do understand that there probably will be um, expert advice that we're going to need, especially when we're talking about coastal resiliency programs or projects. So we're talking about, you know, what does that look like and how do we bring that in? Um, so that will all be part of the review process. So come January 31st, the review process could take us as long as three months. We are hoping to be able to award grants at the end of the first quarter or early in the second quarter. Um, but again, since this is a first go round, I don't want to back us into a corner. We're not going to know what we don't know until we receive those applications and figure out what sort of due diligence do we need to do. So that's essentially what I can tell you about the grant process. Um, I hope that that helps. I've got some Here's. questions for you, Sunny. Sure. Um, I'm sure that um, if you guys hear me typing, um, um, it's because I'm taking notes for Leah, who has COVID, is in home, and oh, I'm going to watch the meeting, but I'm just trying to give her anyway. So, um, so one of the things we would probably apply for um, is um, 
a grant to fund the translation of the CRP into Spanish and other languages such as Portuguese. We've been told by the town that currently there isn't the money for that. Um, we would need first to determine which languages, definitely Spanish, definitely Portuguese, and then what after that. So um, just want to let you know about that and, and wondering if that is a possibility. And then um, you may have noticed that on Thursdays, we are putting out uh, weekly, we are putting out a um, post on social media um, to tell people of, um, about the creation of the plan and what's in the plan and why we're doing it, just to sort of, you know, we've created the, the, the Coastal Resilience Plan. Now we're into public outreach and letting the world know about it, letting the island know about it. So, um, and we are uh, also reaching out to various organizations to put that information into their newsletters and the, and the local media to do that. But we also wanted to um, do printed materials and we wanted to know if that was something if there were grant parameters for that. Um, and um, do you want me to keep going or stop and then keep asking you questions? No, I mean, as everything that you've said seems to fit within the criteria, I'm assuming it's all coastal resiliency related. They seem like they're projects that are ready to go. There's a set beginning, middle and end and a time frame, So they seem like they'd be strong um, contenders for applications. Okay, and you said that the grants are one year grants, but it, it sounded like there might be a little wiggle room. So um, if there's a due date to spend the money, then that's okay for one thing. But then um, is it possible that it might be a two year grant where you would get, let's say the amount was $50,000 for one year and $50,000 for the next. So you would get the money, do what you had to do in, in a year and then when the year ended, you would start working on the next thing and the money would come for that. Is that roughly? Yeah, so the committee hasn't made some firm um, guidelines around that. We at the foundation have promoted very much that idea of make it a one-year grant with a report at the very end to say, we've spent the first set of money that you allocated to us successfully. Here's what we've done. We'd now like to implement part two. And then that would be a release of the second part of the funding. Um, okay. Again, the committee hasn't been very clear on that, but I think that that's the way we've run grants in the past, and, and that's what I would advocate for. And so if you have it, can you send it to us, the evaluation criteria? Is that something that's been determined yet? Um, it's an internal document for evaluation purposes. Yeah, okay. so there, everybody just has access to the application as it stands. Everybody, meaning the applicants? The public, mm -hmm, the applicants. Okay. And then I'm going to, um, um, uh, Sarah Boyce, um, she is our, um, one of our grant, uh, gurus. So whenever we discuss grants, she already knows what we're talking about and she's way ahead of us. And so she helps us understand that. And so is there a way that she can be involved with grant review or maybe she's helping us write, write the grant? Um, you already yeah, have. I I think if she's your guru and go-to, she should definitely lay eyes on your application because it's just like any other grant, right? The clearer you make the picture, the timeline, who you have investments from, what's outlying, the better your application is in general. And that would be any applicant application. So if Sarah's your go-to, I would definitely have you have her lay some oh, eyes on it. Jane Carberg is also a go-to as well. Um, Perfect. You got as, two smart women on it then. As they're both on... They both work for nonprofits and grants are essential parts of their of their lives. Um, so, but you have a grant review committee. You don't need people on it. That's right. right. Yeah. I guess it would be conflict of interest if we had one of our people. You got it. Committee. Right. Okay. <laughs> I should know that. Um, and so um, that's all I had. Um, okay. We have committee members that have things to say. Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Um, thank you, Sunny, so much. Um, I just had a, a quick question. You are emphasizing um, like the projects that are <laughs> projects that are ready to go and kind of on the ground projects. Does that include any planning grants? Like we have in within the CRP, we have projects that like that are um kind of parsed out with like we need consultants to help with like this thing. So it's 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 like, you know ready to go in terms of we know what we need but we but like it's a planning grant more than mm -hmm. anything so is that something that's being considered 
That's a great question. The committee spoke a little bit about that yesterday, and it seems as though they're really looking for things that are further down the road. Um, but I don't think it should deter you from putting in an application because it's all part of the process. But if you're really trying to think about where are my resources best used, those projects that are really ready to go, I think based on the conversations the committee has had, looks like that's what's going to be the first round of awards. Can I ask a follow-up question? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, so the other question was, I know, you know, obviously with the amount of money that you have and you're, you're saying that they're kind of spread out over two years. And so it's not like you have like $2 million to give away, um, without, I, I quickly looked at the application without a stated, like, this is the maximum you can ask for. Let's say we put a big project in with multiple stages. Would that be, would that be something that um, would be frowned upon or is it something that like if we put in a big grant we can be like okay if we if you only have so much money to give like this is what we'll you know we could piece it out if, if that makes sense into three I think pages. that's a yeah I think that's a great way to put an application in because it okay. shows the the big vision and then the committee can kind of decide here's the pieces we want to fund especially if you have other sources of funding that support various pieces it just makes for a stronger picture overall so I think that makes a lot of sense great thank you yeah. And thanks for the vote of confidence, Pete. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Um, if, does anyone else, any other committee members have um, questions or comments for Sunny? Okay. Um, any members of the public have anything to say about this item? Okay. Oh, wait. Vince, go ahead. Um. Thank you, Peter. These are not my questions. Um, I'm just filling in for Leah today. She had one or two kind of technical questions. Do you mind if I hit those, Peter? Yes, go ahead. So um, is there a cap for the number of grants one department or committee can submit? Great question that I don't have an answer to. We might put in more so. OK. <laughs> um, you answer that one. Um, this is kind of a technical one, and this is also valuable to me. Is there a word count restriction on the applications when I was? No, thinking? there's not. So okay, perfect. Thank you. I'm done. Peter. Perfect. All right, um, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick comment. Two million sounds like you know a lot of money, but you split it up over three different entities, and you, uh, you know, and everybody's chomping at the bit. It may it won't go very long. Uh, the committee's talked about sort of possibly, uh, you know, 50,000 is a first year cap, but that's, you know, it's not written in stone. But I also think things that are gonna help are, you know, who else, is, is there cost sharing? Who else is involved? Who is it, who are you involved with? Is it gonna help that, you know, how many Islanders is it helping? Is it something that the whole island benefits or is it a small segment? I mean, those types of things will all have to be taken into consideration and then everybody's, learning as they go let's put it that way so thank you matt anyone else okay thanks a lot sonny for being here can i i have a question in general and this isn't directed necessarily at sonny okay. but it was um and i don't know if it's time for this now or at a later date pete so you can just tell me is that if have as the committee, are we kind of voting and deciding on what we're going to be applying for as part of this? Or have you and Leah already decided? So I think that would be an important discussion for this group. No, we haven't. Decided. I wasn't at the last meeting. I'm sorry. If it was right. already no, we, we haven't decided. I mean, okay. you know, we don't we we found out that there wasn't enough money um, in the communications in the in the department that Florencia, the communications department, outreach, public outreach department that Florencia Rulo is in. We found out that, that they don't have money in their budget to do the translation um, of the CRP. So we need to explore other, other, other avenues. And, and this is one of those avenues. And so, you know, we haven't made a decision to apply for the grant. We wanted Sunny here so she could explain how it works. So we all understood so that we could all then vote on it later. So, you know, if, if it sounds like they're going to take as long as the first quarter of 2024 to do a review of uh, applications that come in, I think knowing our committee that we are definitely all for doing public, uh, doing trans, doing a translation of the plan. Um, so I, I think it's a no brainer that we get going on that right away. But as a, as a committee, we haven't made a formal 
decision to we haven't voted on doing this um so i mean i i guess i guess we could do that now unless we have more discussion we could definitely decide to fill to do a grant for the translation and we could definitely decide to do a grant uh, apply for money for um printed materials of our um public outreach campaign and then um and they go from there and um, since she's going to start since that committee is going to start reviewing in 2024 maybe we should be ahead of the game so okay matt yeah just quick comment i, I think as a committee we should uh look at the translations and that we should be prioritizing against some of the other uh issues that we have like zoning etc that are sort of elephants in the room that we haven't started yet and so you know in this and prioritize so that we're getting the most you know we're, we're doing the so the crack is picking the things that's going to you know do the most good and that we need to get started on first it's great to say let's translate or let's do this or let's do that but let's put that in context and make sure it's going to move us along the most and so i think that conversation is, is difficult but that has to be had at some point well okay i i agree with you and so that and kind of informs what where i think we should go which is at the first meeting in 2024 this is an agenda item and we we make those decisions at that meeting so we don't carry this too far too far into the into the year uh go ahead gary uh, with respect to that translation issue, uh, we've already, as a committee, talked about it. I yep. think we've all agreed to do it, and that's why you, as our you and Leah, as our representatives, went to the to the communications people and asked them to do the yep. translation. So I'm not sure you really need to go and have a formal vote on that, because we we've all already said something we want to get done. Yes, Gary. And but you know then applying for the grant is an, another discussion and I I agree with you but I also agree with with Matt and he brought something up that I wasn't thinking about that what are other are other priorities for grants we have those should all be discussed and it, I don't think it's any harm waiting until um, till our first meeting in January um, and I'm sure that that we'll we'll make a decision at that meeting and then get going on it so. Um, Go ahead, Jen. Thanks, Pete. Um, I, I heard what you just said at the end there. I was just going to encourage that if we knew as a committee that there was something we potentially wanted to, to apply for, because it sounds like Vince is thinking and Vince and Lee are thinking we might end up applying for more than one grant from this committee uh, to move on that now, because if things are due at the end of January, it seems like a lot of time there, but grants take a significant amount of time to put together and get reviewed. And I would hate to, if there was work to do in the next two weeks before the holidays, that it, it doesn't start getting done now. Um, that would be kind of my my push is that if we know that there's something we really want to move forward on to do it sooner rather than later. Okay. You know, this is where I need Leah. Um it was like, uh, what was the amount? 17,000 or something like that, or maybe it was more for um, the translation. And then the printed materials, she didn't give me a number for that. So I don't know what that is. That's a separate amount. Um, so if I'm, so if someone wanted to make a motion that we apply for grants for both those things, that's great, but I we still need Leah to advise us on it. Um, so, um, but it's there's no harm in making a motion to do that and 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 then going from there we could always backtrack so go ahead Sarah thank you yeah I mean I brought this up in the first place and if we're going to discuss it now I do I do not think we should apply for the translations with this funding opportunity I think we should I mean this is my opinion but I think we should have a bigger discussion about it it's so important that we have the information translated I'm not saying that at all we already voted on it but I think in terms of the amount, like the translations are are not that expensive. You said 17,000 for the whole thing. I think that we can, I, I don't, I just think it needs to be a bigger discussion than just moving this one forward. I think this 
has the potential to have more money. Um, and so I think some of our other projects that might be kind of ready to go that might need more money. But I mean, that was just my opinion. I don't think we should just push it along. I think we should have a real discussion as a group, including Leah, maybe we wait for her to come back um, about what the next steps are. All right, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Joanna. Hi, um, I agree with Sarah 100%. I think that this money would be, we would be far better served to prioritize also, as Matt said, some of the other projects on our list. I think that um, translation is critically important and so are our printed materials, but there's other places we can find money for that. I don't think that the place to get that money is from this grant. And I do think we should have a broader discussion about the priorities and what things from the list we think we can use um, we think we could use money like this for. I think this needs to be a strategic, really strategic ask. Um, and I do think that we can, again, find money for those other things in other places. Thanks, Joanna. Vince? Um, I'm not going to advise on what the committee should or shouldn't do. I'm just going to be basic here. As I understand it, the figure of 17, about 17,000 is correct, Peter. And the only internal discussion I'm aware of on that is that the communications office in admin and natural resources neither have the funding uh, or for, have that money available to undertake the translation. So I don't know that that money can come from the town side currently. So that should probably figure in your uh, deliberations. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Vince. Well, um, then we need, I think, unless there's more discussion, I we need a we need to take a vote on how we're going to proceed. So if someone wants to give us a motion um, on what we're doing here, and I guess it would it'd roughly be around, are we going to decide on grants now or are we going to wait until till our next meeting to have a proper discussion? So somebody can fire away. Jen. Thanks, Pete. Just a clarifying question. Is our... And, and I apologize if I just haven't taken it off our, my calendar. Is our next meeting December 26th or is it January 9th? No, we collectively decided at the last meeting, I believe it was the last meeting, that the 26th was, um, you know, yeah. all of us are going to be in our jammies eating leftovers and playing with our gifts and who's going to want to have a meeting. So we decided no meeting on the 26th. And then I believe the next meeting is is January 9th, I think. Um, let me just look here. Yeah, it's January 9th is the next meeting. So it's not too far into January for us to solve it. And I don't see us, you know, continuing and continuing. We all have a lot of opinions and are pretty strong in our convictions right now. So we, I'm sure we can prioritize the grants, um, you know, the grant, um, what we need the grants for at that meeting. And, and get going from there. So, Vince. Thank you. As a suggestion, just to move things along, um, if committee members uh, wish to email Peter and Leah with uh, possible grant idea suggestions, just so that they're listed, and then that could move it along for discussion and hurry things along for the meeting on the 9th to have a set list. Just an idea, Pete. Yeah. Okay, Vince, I'll take you up on that. Um, so we could consider that homework for the ninth. Um, and um, I will um, I, um, I'll send that to Leah. And then she, I guess what I'll do is I'll assign the homework and then and let Leah know um, we're doing that but still um if someone could make a motion um to the effect of what we're talking about now um so we can formalize it i'll make a motion to submit grant ideas in the prioritization scheme to pete and leah and for discussion on january 9th second that cover it <laughs> okay is there a discussion Okay, roll call vote. Jen Carberg? Aye. Doug Rose? Aye. 
Jerry Beller. Aye. Sarah Boyce. Aye. Um, Joanna Roach. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. Chair votes aye. All right. Thank you, guys. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, is there a public comment about this issue? I'm looking right at you and Deanne and RJ and Shelly and Amy. And you guys are quiet. And I'm also looking at Anne. So, um, all right. So the next item is a discussion uh, from the last meeting on pools and designated floodplains. And again, this was brought, brought forth by um, Amy, Amy Cohane of 76 Union Street. And we, she, she brought that up, um, but then um, we didn't really, we kind of discussed it, but um, we thought we, we could benefit from um, having committee members say what they think about this with the understanding that the Conservation Commission is in the process of revising its um, um, the Nantucket Wetlands Bylaw and that eventually they are going to kick out their recommendations that will include something on this subject. But this would be a good exercise just to sort of prepare us ourselves for maybe supporting them on that. So what do we all think? Um, RJ, we're doing public comment af afterwards, so you're, I'm, I'm going to ignore you till the end. So go ahead, Gary. Uh, the question I have is, um, I'm, I am certainly in favor of the proposed uh, uh, new regulations uh, regarding the restriction of pools in these areas next to the harbor uh, or the water, wherever it is. Uh, my question is, uh, if the proposed regulations are accepted as put forward according to the Conservation Commission now, will those pools that are the ones we are talking about at this meeting, will they be a violation of the rules or will they be permitted anyway? Are you talking about the pools that are now in the process of being built and permitted? I'm talking about uh, what, what what we were told is that there's a whole bunch of pools being proposed in this area. And my question is, um, would if the Conservation Commission's proposed regulations uh, become in effect, would those, po would those pools be permitted to be built or are, are they in violation of the new proposed regulations? If they get approved before, if those pools get approved before those regulations are revised, then they'll be grandfathered, I assume. What I don't know is if the if the permitting process is ongoing while that happens, I don't know if that makes those go away or not. I'm not the I'm not that person. That's maybe a question for Vince or Jeff. So Vince, if you would mind, if you could shed some light on that. I'm afraid I can't. That is very much a Jeff question. Apologies. I will get an answer from Jeff and I'll seek a written one that we can send to you, Peter and Leah. Okay. So it's deferred, Gary. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, are, they, are they all in the process of being built now or are they just in the plans that have been submitted to the HDC? Does Andy know that? And do you know the answer to that? Can you answer that, Amy? I, uh, two Mariner Way has been permitted. Four and six Mariner Way are um, going to be reviewed on Thursday evening by the CONCOM. They have not received in their current proposal form, they have not received uh, approval from the HDC. Does that help? Yes, it does. So permitted ones, I would assume, will be grandfathered. The ones that are still in motion if the if those amendments to the bylaw are done while they're in motion that's a question for jeff does that answer your question gary uh, yes uh i would hope that i would hope that the conservation commission uh in fact i would hope two things first that we could have a quick motion in support of the restriction to additional pools being built in that area because they would be in violation of the proposed regulations. 
And then I would, that's the first thing I would hope that we would do the motion. So show the Conservation Commission we're in support of that. And then second, I would hope that when the Conservation Commission has to meet and deal with that, um, even though the regulations are not yet fully affected, I would hope they would turn turn down those requests for the permit, even though the regulations have not been finalized. That's what I would hope, two hopes. Um, I would say we don't know what they're going to do yet. I mean, I have an inkling, we all have an inkling of what those um, revisions would be, but I don't think we should vote to support something that isn't final yet. Why not? That's what we want to do. We want to we want to continue to protect our shorelines, and having a whole bunch of pools right by the edge of the shorelines are, are not going to not very good for the island. We had the discussion before about um, waiting until the concom came up with what they're going to submit. And so we may be voting on something that doesn't exist yet or something that exists now, but it's going to change, which means we would have to. Um, anyway. But um, this is the voice. This is the voice that the conservation is looking for. They're looking for opinions from the public as to what the rules ought to do and whether or not these proposed guidelines, you know, are favored by the public. And we're an important part of the public, I think, that we ought to express our views. Even if they don't get accepted, let them know that we feel that they are good and those particular regulations should be enacted. Okay, I hear you. Okay. Um, members of the public will get to you when we're done with this discussion. So you guys can put your hands down now. Um, go ahead, Joanna. Um, I am tending to agree with Gary. I'm wondering what is the best way for us to influence the outcome of this situation? Wouldn't it be for us to write a letter right now and say, we know you are considering this. Here's our here's our recommendations from where we sit so that they have that in advance of making the decision. I, I do think that that would be a better process. We kind of talked about kind of doing that for the whole thing that they wanted to do. And then we did, did have the discussion with, where we would wait until um, they came up with a definitive amendments. I mean, I we're not a. Would there be a point? Can Pete? Could we invite them to come and talk to us at this meeting? Yeah, we can do that. But we. I mean, I feel like, like there should be some dialogue and some way to, you know, discuss this. I I. Yes, we could, um, and we had um, we had Ian at, at our meeting, and I I recall we decided to wait, but then I'm just concerned that that this kind of snowballs, and then some other other issue unrelated to pools comes up, and then we react to that. We react to that when we were really going to wait till the end to react all at once. So I don't think that we're going to be able to influence the Conservation Commission to to prohibit a, a given pool application right now. And that's just what I think. Peter. Matt, hold Peter. it, Gary. Oh, Gary. 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 Yes. Gary. Okay. You have to wait your turn. Matt is next, and I'll get to you. Oh, okay. Okay. No, I how about this? Why don't we just say that we support their, their making the changes they're making? And that, and that we hope that they use, you know, science and best practices to ensure that, you know, items that will influence coastal resiliency are addressed. Keep it short and sweet and let them put the meat on the bones. We just say we support doing the right thing. Thank you for doing it. Because they're getting a lot of pressure not to do the right thing. Yeah. You know, so, I, so anyway, I think there might be a way to thread the needle here and say we're on your side. And we want you to take coastal resiliency and, you know, in water migration and everything else into consideration. Thank you very much. You know, we got your back. Something short and sweet. Hmm, interesting. All right. Thanks, Matt. Do you want to say something, Gary? Yeah, I agree with Matt. And I think we should do it. And I think we have to do it before Thursday. If Thursday they're going to have those hearings, because if we don't, then they're going to get permitted perhaps on Thursday and our voice afterwards is, as, as we concluded, it's probably not going to be effective because it'll already be permitted. So I think we should follow Matt's suggestion. Uh, general 
uh, a general comment of support and get it to them before Thursday's meeting. Vince, did you have a hand up? Uh, I did, and thank you, uh, Peter. So I just wanted to add the note of caution, and it's obvious that uh, the Conservation Commission are the ultimate arbiters on wetland-related um, matters. It would just be an opinion uh, from the Coast Resilience Advisory Committee, and um, I have to say, I'm, it, Matt's suggestion was very good uh, to do some kind of letter supporting them for the best outcomes for wetland management. But I would also very strongly caution that you sh uh, the commission, uh, this committee shouldn't make decisions or um, advocate on individual properties, but on say a larger issue like all pools in all wetlands, frame it like that, so that it's not just taken as something to do with one property that's already before uh, the Conservation Commission. And that's, I guess, the point that I was trying to make is that we're not the committee that, that is the individual property advocate. We are a whole island or a whole region of island coastal resilience plan. And I understand that 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 we're going to get members of the public like Amy coming to us and and alerting us to a situation. But it, you know, Vince is right. We can't. We can't specifically speak for you, for a property, um, for aggrieved property owners, um, for individual things. It has to be more broad reaching. So um, who else? Oh, Doug, go ahead. Yeah, just to add to the mix here. I mean, every one of us on this Zoom call is a member of the public. And there's nothing that prevents all of us from writing individual letters to the CONCOM expressing our support for their upcoming efforts to, you know, re revise the Wetland Protection Act uh, bylaw, but also to express our individual concern about this one property that's under development. I, I do think it's a little bit troublesome for us to get engaged as a committee in individual property debates. I've heard other people say that. And I, I kind of feel the same way. I, I don't doubt that this is a huge issue, and I, I totally respect where Amy's coming from. I just I'm troubled by the thought that in the context of this meeting, we're going to come up with a draft letter that we can get out by Thursday that 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 fe feels right as a committee action. That's all. Thank you. And I hear that. And, you know, if it's Leah or myself writing the letter, there's no way for you guys to see it, to approve it. You just have to trust us that it's going to that it's going to come together. So that's another thing to consider, because the next meeting that we have is the ninth. And if we were to follow to make absolutely sure that the letter is what we wanted, you wouldn't be able to see it until before that meeting. So um, anyway, go ahead, Jen. Um, can you let Vince go first and I can go? I, I think he wanted sure, to Vince, react. Go ahead. Really brief point and thank you, Jen and Peter. Uh, Doug, um, I just have to be careful on this one. I have no idea if this would actually apply or not, but it could if the whole committee or a quorum of committee members sent letters like what you're suggesting. That could potentially be an open meeting law violation of chain or serial communication. Just caution. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Jen. Thank you, Vince. Thanks, Peter. And thanks, Vince. And just jumping into this, I think you know, I'm hearing the caution we are, you know, an advisory committee and our, our point is to advise the public, but also to advise other committees and commissions within the town. I think we would be within do within our purview of doing what Matt had suggested as far as putting together a general letter, letter of encouragement to the CONCOM, following what they're working on with updating their regulations. And I don't think it would be bad to call particular attention to this issue because we have had the public come and bring it to us and just noting that the conservation committee or the, the um, crack is in support of regulations that help protect the resiliency of our floodplains, particularly as it comes to structures being permitted within our floodplains. I think we could say something like that and not, not point it to a particular property because I think when it comes to the CONCOM putting together the regulation changes when those proposals are made, I don't think we're going to feel differently about regulations within the floodplains. I think this is an issue that it it makes sense within considering coastal resilience um, and and regulations within the floodplains that we wouldn't have a change of of 
opinion, I guess, as, as a advisory committee for what we would recommend or support for this, I don't think it would hurt to kind of walk that line that Matt was talking about, but even specifically bring up that idea of resiliency in floodplains. I mean, I hear what you're saying. I just worry about setting a precedent that, that, that the crack becomes known as a committee that will advocate for individual property owners or individual, you know, I just, I just worry about that or, or I worry about get, getting scolded by the town for, for straying. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not fully up on this. So, um, and I think that, but I think that that's a way that whoever wrote the letter could word it so that, so that this neighborhood could be mentioned, but not specific lots. And then we can mention other neighborhoods such as, um, <clears throat> the pool that was, that was proposed out on main Ave and, and, areas where we know the water will come up and put that chlor chlorinated crap into the, into the whatever. So we, you know, we could mention several situations like that um, to make it more general. Uh, go ahead, Joanna. I, I agree with Jen. I, I think that we should write a short letter of Jen, Matt, who also said this, Gary, I think we should write a short letter. And I like the approach that you're saying where we're mentioning multiple locations and I think we could do that before Thursday and get it out because I do think it is effective from an advisory capacity for another town committee to get the information from us before they make the vote. One, I think it signals that we're paying attention to what's happening. And I think that um, encouraging, you know, coastal resiliency as a primary goal is super important for us. Like we're advocating for our own position. So it sounds like I'm going to be writing a letter. Huh. <laughs> I, I bet you could get some help here. <laughs> I don't think Leah is able to put a few words together because she has COVID and I'm not going to ask her to do it. So um, um, as I may have said to the committee before, um, I'm it's secretary for, uh, for SHAB. And whenever a letter is written, a lot of times what happens is we approve the writing of the letter, but we need to, we expediency is what we need. So the committee basically takes a vote to trust me to write the proper letter based on what what the committee is telling me. So I'm taking copious notes so that I understand what you want me to do. Um, so I'm just telling you that. Vince, go ahead. Minor point, and thank you, Peter. The um, packet and the agenda for the um, for for the ConCon meeting on Thursday is already up. Um, we might want to at least provide notice uh, to the conservation agent that some, to expect something for an addition or an amendment to their packet. And I think I can look after that, Peter, and copy you on it. But just okay. because it's a, it's something we want to put on their agenda, there's also the chance that this might take time to get written, so we might miss um, a cutoff. Just well, I can write it this afternoon, and I don't imagine it's going to be more than a couple of paragraphs. I'm okay. not going to go into too much detail because that's not what we're all about. The, the, the detailed letter is what we write after the CONCOM has come up with what is going to be vo voted on, vo voted on yay or nay for the whole thing that they're changing. Then we look at that. Then we do a detailed letter. Um, but this is just one portion of what what they're talking about. So, and it's general, like everybody seems to be saying. So I can do that after I go to WPI. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, Vince. Um, Okay, uh, Matt. Peter, I think it can be a couple, two or three sentences. Yeah. We, I wouldn't even, I don't think you even have to name all the other places that are like that place. You, you don't even have to name that place. You just send a letter for that hearing that says we appreciate everything you're doing and look forward to the recommendations and hope, you know, supporting your recommendations. And we hope you take climate resiliency into account in the hearings that you're having today and in the future that's our you know that that you know there's nothing more important in these at risk areas thank you very much goes to resiliency we do have to mention the pools cuz that's what we're talking about but i can keep it very general yeah keep it general but just i would keep it general and you know when in dealing with pools or second dwellings or whatever you could keep it very general but i think it's can be short and sweet and just get our point across okay Okay, so for me to do this, unless there's more comment, um, I, I'm sensing that, that we're all 
in agreement, but still for, for you guys to tell me to do it, I need a I need a motion for that. Oh, oh hold on a minute. Um we'll take the public comment and then we can do that. Yeah, so um okay, Ann, go ahead. Hi, um, and U.S. here. Thank you very much for um, for having this fruitful and useful discussion and allowing us to weigh in a little bit. I just um, wanted to let you know what I know about these regulations. Um, I follow the issue very, very closely, generally speaking. Um, the um, the the key regulation is an expansion of buffer zones um, yes. by twenty five feet. Yes. And this has put the construction industry into an apoplectic, apoplectic fit because it means that a lot more area cannot be um, used for pools. Now, um, one thing that the Conservation Commission did sneak into the discussion is the possibility of a uh, an exemption from these regulations for, quote, above ground pools. Um, it's not obvious to me why they should be exempted when you have a concrete barrier, whether it sits two feet in the earth or one foot above the earth, it's a concrete barrier and has all of the negatives in um, land subject to coastal flowage, um, as you would expect from even an in-ground pool. Um, the logic there escapes me, but uh, you should also know if you don't already, that the pools that are uh, before the Conservation Commission at the moment on Mariner Way are above ground pools. They started off with below ground pools, but they morphed into above ground pools um, because of for the obvious reasons, which RJ will be able to explain to you. He's got his hand up and he's been following the Mariner Way situation very, very carefully. So I just thought I would um, throw that out there. The other thing that I um, am aware of is that the, um, the process for getting these regulations into um, to be codified has slowed down a lot because um, of pressure to have them reviewed by the select board and this board and that board, and who knows, maybe the senior center knitting group. But um, it's it's definitely there's a lot of a lot of effort to slow them down as much as possible. So I I am very hopeful that you will write this letter because they need as much support as they can possibly get. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ann. RJ, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Brace, RJ Turcotte, on behalf of the NLWC. Um, as Ann mentioned, I've been following this very closely. I've already written comment letters, and I would just like to have the committee take a step back here from the regulatory update. Our organization's position here is that the commission has the power to regulate these pools and make them more coastal resilient with the regulations that already exist, that already are the ones they're referring to, specifically land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, it's a very vague part of the wetlands bylaw. It only has five performance standards. Uh, really only two of them matter, number four, number five. Number four is building upon areas subject to coastal storm flowage in locations where such structures would be subject to storm damage may not be permitted. And number five is the commission may impose such additional requirements as are necessary to protect the interests protected by the bylaw. That's on page 39 of the existing already in place legally bound uh, wetlands regulations. The commission right now has the power to, since pools are considered structures just like a house, have those pools, the lower level of the pool, raised to the same height as the house, because hypothetically, these structures would face the same storm action if a hurricane were to come through and wave action were to hit that property, whether it's Mariner Way or any of the other pools that are going to come through before the regulatory update. They have the power to do this, but it hasn't been done before, and they're definitely unsure of how to go about it. But there's a lot of language already in the CRP advising uh, property builders not to build in vulnerable areas if uh, they're going to experience this kind of flooding within the life of a 30-year mortgage. So uh, we're of the mind that, 
of course, we want to support the regulatory updates. But we don't know how long those are going to take, but that the commission could be doing more and could be using the language that's already in place and could use um, Crack's advice to use that language from performance standard four and five of land subject to coastal storm flowage to make these pools more resilient uh, if they are going to be built before the regulatory update. Um, so thank you. So, RJ, what are you what are you advising us to do? Do you agree with us writing a general letter? Yes. Okay. Just and, want to make sure I understood that because you were yes. saying you said backing off regulatory, which right. we're not regulatory anyway. We just advise regulatory. So yeah. You're I think saying, what I'm saying is that currently, even without obviously the regulatory update is coming we don't know when it's going to be but right now as the regulations stand the commission can be doing more to make these pools more resilient it is completely legally within their power to do so it just hasn't been done before and they could use a little guidance to use the language already in uh, their regulations currently to raise the pools All right thank you now we're going to go to amy and then i think we're going to take a vote because we got to get going on this agenda so go ahead amy Hi, Amy Cohane is a direct to butter to the uh, Mariner Way. Uh, I just want to thank you very much for um, considering writing this letter. And I would like to say that I could be on hand for anybody who needs any details. Uh, I know you don't want to talk about individual properties, but I'm just saying I'm available. And I also wanted to say that um, I we are concerned that uh, two pools uh, on Easton Street and Brant Point were used as the precedents for our pools. And uh, then two is being used as a precedent for four and six. So I really appreciate what you're doing because it's you're not talking just about these individual pools, but the crazy amount of precedent setting. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Amy. With respect to what you're saying, yes, we don't want the individual details because we cannot be, we cannot be, um, protectors of individual lots and individual people it's 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 not really our purview so anyway but we are it sounds like we are going to be writing a letter um i just meant for context but i i completely sure. understand um i may stay still mention certain areas but not individual lots matt go ahead yeah peter i'm thinking you know maybe the the you know one of the sentences is you know follow existing or improved rules and, and just sort of leave it at that. Don't dictate to them which existing, but say that we've got strong, you know, strong rules now, and you and we look, we're we're happy you're strengthening them, and we hope you continue to use those for that for the purposes, you know, coastal to prove coastal resiliency, et cetera, et cetera. Just keep it because I think what RJ is saying is very true that they could they could take a tougher stand now on some of this, I believe, and maybe that needs to be clarified. But I think we should sort of give them the backup to do that. So thank you. All right. You, know, you want a motion? I'll make a motion yeah. that Peter writes a letter to, you know, to Concom, the general letter to for them to do what we've discussed. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Gary. Okay. Roll call vote. Matt the Aye. Doug Rose. Aye. Jen Carberg. Aye. Gary Beller. Aye. Joanna Roach. Aye. Sarah Boyce. Aye. Rachel Freeman. Aye. Chair votes aye. Okay, thanks everybody. Looks like I'm gonna be busy this afternoon. So um Okay, uh, Vince is here. One of the reasons Vince is here, other than to um, do his best Leah in, in impression, is to give us an update on the harbor's sediment transfer and study and dredge plan. Um, go ahead, Vince, and share your screen, screen if you need to. Uh, thank you, Peter. I don't need to share screens. It'll be a brief update. Oh, and just to say on the last item, Peter, I can get you a letterhead for the submission to the Conservation Commission. Okay. Okay, so... Um, Sediment transport study and dredge plan for the harbours. Um, we're about eight months into an 18 month project, so due for completion in October uh, 2024. 
if all goes according to plan. And so far, things largely are going according to plan. Uh, we did have one or two issues along the way. Um, one of the things we needed to do was have very precise uh, water level data and tidal data over one month timeframes in different places. And due to uh, uh, the, the monitoring equipment being damaged, damaged naturally by waves and by um, boaters and things, and things just happen along the way. Uh, we had one or two delays in collecting that data. I want to say a particular thanks to NCF and Jenk Harburg, who helped uh, collect some of the Palpus Harbour uh, water data and gave us permission to use some of their uh, facilities. And thanks to a million. Thank you very kindly for that, to NCF and Jen in particular. So we now have all the water level data that we have, and we can now proceed. It's one of the key components in the model. Um, the other big thing that we have in the model is the bathymetric uh, studies. Um, all of the bottom of that, well, most of the bottom of the harbors, Nantucket Harbor, Pulpus Harbor, Madigat Harbors, were studied and um, looked at where the sandbars are and just collect a, a proper snapshot of it. That's another big part of it. Another snapshot that was also collected at the same time was the mapping of the eelgrass beds. It wasn't done the exact same way as the, as the state does it, looking at density and this kind of things. It was just presence or absence, and we just mapped out all the eelgrass beds for that because we need to know those areas for once we get into the dredging to, to, to not have impacts on those kind of areas. Uh, another component in the model was um, the uh, sediment sampling. Sediment sampling was taken from a large number of areas in all three harbors, and the results that we've come back so far are all quite good. There's minimal um, anthropomorphic uh, human-made uh, contaminants. You know, the odd piece of plastic or old rubbish turns up here and there, but that's just what it is. Um, but the big thing is the compatibility of the material. It seems to be quite compatible for my favourite part of the sediment transport study and dredge plan, the beneficial reuse of any materials. Um, so we have all of these parts in place. Now we know the quality of the sand, we know the water levels, we know the bathymetry, we know where uh, sensitive habitats like eelgrass are. Um, and now the model is being constructed. That's where we are right now, constructing the model to understand how sand moves around in harbours over time. So there's a lot of parts that go into a sediment transport study. It's, um, it's uh, interesting to say the least, it's quite in depth. Um, now that the model is being under, uh, looked at, we can understand where we can then undertake dredge efforts. That's the next phase that we're going to move into. Um, once we can see where we can dredge and then understand how various sandbars and how various um, things move around over time, we want to have be, be cautious of a few things. So that if we dredge an area for navigation, what the impact might be, so that how long it might last. And something that Jen Carberg thanks again, alerted me to is the potential that any dredging activities could starve uh, uh, wetland areas of sediment movement over time. And that's something we want to avoid quite clearly because that's a potential negative impact. So now that we've got all this, we're starting to move through the modeling. We don't have anything to show yet. Once we have the model, that's something I want to bring back to that, this committee at that point, uh, if I just wanted to give the update. There's one other thing that um, I saw that could be of interest to this committee. I don't know that this is going to work yet. Once I saw the bathymetry and all the bathymetric data and the kind of information they were collecting, um, I was running through uh, various CRP projects with Leah uh, about a day after one of the update meetings from with the consultants. And I thought, well, some of this is actually very similar information that we would actually need for say one of the CRP projects, CO2 breaching. So I approached um, the consultants and asked, is this something that you can include? It would make it a much uh, cheaper study of sorts because the base data would already be there. So it's just an extra part to their modeling. They have not yet come back with an answer. The other thing I'd have to figure out is funding. So another thing to put on the list. I have no idea what that cost would be either, but it's just I'm looking for an additional benefit to say that we might be able to do this other study a bit more cheaply and get an extra benefit from this. Um, so that's about where we are. So that's the harbour dredging. There's been a big question over time about how we do the whole remainder of the island and get the timeframes on that. I'm still working on that, and that's something that's a big question for me. I've said it before. It want, we want to match it up with a project. 
that's why the sediment transport study and dredge plan are happening together for the harbors because they're a matched project if we were to do say a big study of sediment transport on the south shore we'd have to have a reason to do it and it would be beneficial to match it up with say something to do with the airport the sewer beds uh, where we already have erosion and have problems and anything for the Madicate area now here's a question if we do it what kind of area do we need to match up the sediment transport study for these are massively expensive studies and the further you go from shore to get a better understanding the more expensive it gets because you're having to in encompass a larger area and our open ocean is well it's oceanic it's huge so do we go within a few hundred yards uh, half a mile or one mile from the south shore and then again i hate to say it but whatever the project is say it's the sewer beds that will dictate the area where we need to understand the sediment transport study for how effective any project would be at the sewer beds. And then you can duplicate that in other areas. So it is a lovely idea to try and under, uh, to undertake it for the whole outer shores, but without a project to match it with, it becomes void quite quickly because you get one storm, the sandbars move, and then you'd have to do it again. Um, it, it's it's I don't want to waste money or effort on it. I want to have the best bang for the buck. And it is a useful thing to do to have sediment transport studies for the outer shore. But even on the inner harbours, we're seeing that there's enough movement to cause inconsistencies and uncertainty. So then when you get into the more dynamic ocean environments, it's a problem. So it's a great idea, still um, trying to make it work. Uh, but make it work in context for projects we need. Um, there was one more thing. Oh, no, that's it. I covered it. All right. Thanks, Vince. Doug, did you have a question? Yeah, Vince. Uh, and thank you, Peter. Uh, Vince, I was just curious because I, I don't know. I don't know enough about the project you're describing, but I assume it is it has dual purpose, right? One is the dredging of navigation channels so that you know, it's effectively for the functioning of the harbor harbors, but also the potential to identify and quantify uh, sand sources for future beach nourishment initiatives and whatnot. Is that right? Correct. That was one of the things I forgot. Thank you. So one of the things we're looking at on land to match up with the sediment transport study is some place to hold, store, process any dredge sand if it needs it. Sometimes it, it might need a little processing. I'm just kind of making it up now. If there's too much gravel in it or too much silt in it. For the most part, what we're seeing in Nantucket Harbour and Palpus Harbour, uh, sorry, and Madigan Harbour, um, the condition of the sand is good enough that it could just be held, not processed, and then put on a beach once it becomes inert. It might take up to a year of storage uh, for the sand to become inert so that the recipient site um, doesn't have any major impacts. Oh, like... It, there might you might need some grading, like if there's a lot of shell in it or something to that effect, so that we don't end up purposefully putting a lot of um, the wrong kind of shell on the wrong kind of beach. Um, but these are the kind of things that we need to consider. Uh, where do we have a piece of area of land to for the town to hold, store, process, and then use the material for the beneficial reuse um, um, on beach nourishment or wherever it happens to be? Thank you, Vince. Anyone else have any questions or comments for Vince? Uh, any members of the public? Okay. Um, we move on to number seven. And I need to say that number, number seven, number nine, and number 10, Leah has requested that we push those to the next meeting because those really involve her and she's not able to... Um, Ad adequately well she's not able to be here so um i don't think we're going to get any complaints from everyone um, that we're shortening the meeting so um but we do have um item number eight the discussion on what to include um on the town's coastal resilience web page um as we as you recall this is um you know facilitated by links from the media not only from uh, this will be a landing place from the links from the public outreach we're doing on Thursdays, the tiles that that uh, um, Leo was talking about and that she showed us at the last meeting. And it was part of our homework to come up with 
um, items for this. So um, let's see if I can do this. Peter, I'm ready to share if you, if you, unless you want to. Can you share it? Okay, go ahead. Just direct me as you need, Peter. Not the real estate one, Vince. It's a little box with lines. It's page eight. Yeah, right there. Oh, yeah, right there. Can I, everyone see that? It's a little small. That okay? Yep. Yeah. yeah. I guess what I'm looking for is, you know, any comments, any questions, and does anybody have any additions? Can you scroll down just a little bit, Pete? Vince, can you scroll down a bit? Okay. Oh, no. Got it. Thanks. So... So these were suggestions from all of you guys. Is there anybody who wants to add anything or change anything, or are there any comments? I do. Is that Joanna? Okay. Yes, it's me. Uh, okay, there's a, the, my comment would be there's nothing in here about how we're going to pay for it. <laughs> okay. Right. Oh. So I do think, you know, financing and then uh, like maybe there could be a part where it explains the the projects that we've already done and what we've paid for them or, or that ones that have been approved and what the mechanisms are going forward. Okay. Great. Funding as a new category, funding. Okay. Um, new category. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I was going to say funding, and uh, and I think almost a principle we could be talking is, you know, we're going to have. That because we are looking at the, the town is looking at uh, coastal resiliency districts or whether they could do it with betterments. That's still on Libby's to do list and that hasn't been done yet. But I think that just the general principle that those gaining benefit are going to be paying some because the the total cost is so high that this can't all just go on the tax base. I think that should be in that should be in our messaging. That as much of this is going to be paid for by those you know benefiting so that we can get as many projects as possible done especially the ones that you know that that benefit the entire community such as the steamship and the downtown you know something like that could be in there thank you okay all right um sarah go ahead thanks pete um so it's sort of in this, but it, it says recommendation status and like the projects underway are complete. But I think um, we should have one that's like a, a line item that's accomplishments. Um, and it some of it will be the projects, but some of it might be those other things like the education tools or I, some of the work that Leah's done. I don't know. I, I just think it's a nice spot to put things that have been successful. Um, so it's, I mean, it's very, this is very forward looking, looking at what are the things that we're planning to work on and what, but it's kind of nice to have some of that somewhere. Um, and then the only other thing is sort of more of a practical thing. I think on the website, there should be a direct link to the YouTube channel for the crack meetings. They're actually quite hard to find <laughs> when I have missed a meeting and had to look for one. Um, so I think if we can add that to that website, I think it would be very beneficial. Great idea. Yep. Um, and then lastly, a list of members. I don't know. I, I think that's sort of maybe a given, but it's um 
you know, <laughs> I think on the regular, like on the town website, there's already like the list of members and the term. And I don't know if that needs to be said for this as well. Okay. And I, I didn't look at, I admit, I didn't look at this week's minutes, um, but I assume that Doug Rose is putting the link for, for the, for the meeting that he did the minutes for in the, uh, in the minutes for people to, to get to that. Um, yeah, the YouTube link is in every meeting, in every meeting minute. Sorry. All right. Um, go ahead, Gary. You think we should have a category that just says communications, which covers all of our different ways we're going to be communicating with the public, whether it's by, you know, the various methods we've already started to use. Yeah, we can have that. Okay. Very good. Anybody else? Okay. Um, well, is there any public comment? Okay. All right, very good. I'll make sure Leah gets all of that. Um, and so we are on to number 11 public outreach ideas, strategies from committee members. Um, and this again is something I wanted on our agenda every every meeting so that if you guys just have wild ideas, whatever you want to throw out, it, it, not on the agenda that you wanted to let me know about, <clears throat> let fly. If you if you don't, that's fine. This is just there for you guys, for, for us, um, sort of our, our own public comment. Um, if not, then um, Doug Rose is going to do a media scorecard summary, and it was in the packet. So go ahead, Doug. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, just one uh, idea I want to throw out there, uh, sort of building off of a comment that Sarah had made several meetings ago. I think we should be always on the lookout for topical uh, content to add to, to make our outreach that much more sort of timely. And so saw a lot of photos of the of the flooding that was going on, <laughs> uh, standing groundwater and whatnot. Um, Easy Street was flooded this weekend. So just I guess the point was don't limit ourselves to the uh, the physical content, the photos and whatnot that are embedded in the CRP. We can be supplementing those with things that are happening right now. Just the thought. Um, so back to the, the media scorecard, I have to apologize. It looks like a total eye chart in the packet. I can't imagine anybody is really able to read much from that. It's uh, you, need, you need like an electron microscope. Um, oh, thank you, Vince, if you're pulling it up. Um, More page. It, uh, it's near the end, I think. Um, I'll just give you call outs of headlines that we we're learning a lot, I'd say, as we're as we're going here. Um, starting with the fact that beyond the original messages that are posted through the Natural Resource Department's Facebook and Instagram pages, we've now gotten a total of eight different organizations who, to repost at least one of our posts via their social media outlets. That includes the Town of Nantucket Admin, um, Nantucket Conservation Foundation, Nantucket Land Bank, Nantucket Coastal Conservancy, uh, Remains Envision and Resilience, uh, uh, Mariah Mitchell Association, UMass Nantucket Field Station, and acclimate have all um, done at least one post so far in the first, uh, let's call it five weeks, if you include the, um, I'm sorry, four weeks, if you include the intro week. Um, beyond social media, I think um, Peter mentioned earlier, we are reaching out to a variety of, of these organizations and others to see if they might have a willingness to post some of this content in their e-newsletters. And we've received agreement from several. Um, we, we're, uh, we're in touch with other groups like Nantucket Land and Water Council, Linda Loring Nature Foundation, the Civic League, and the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we've gotten relative expressions of interest. In some cases, with like the Chamber of Commerce, understandably, I think they have they've expressed uh, an interest in things that are custom specific to the interests and concerns of their audience, meaning business owners and what have you. So, you know, uh, Leah and I have gone back and forth with each other as to how we might attack each of these opportunities. But it's, I would say it feels really good that we've gotten the kind of response we've gotten so far. Um, that said, I think there's a lot more audiences that we can reach out to. Um, thanks to Shelley Lockwood for bringing up the idea of having a, a you know advanced education class specific to the CRP, you know that would help us reach all those realtors at the bottom of this list that to some degree don't 
they don't seem like natural allies to uh, to our mission, and yet um, there could be a really nice fit for them. Uh, so so far, the the punchline is our campaign is generating around somewhere between ten and twenty thousand impressions per week. Uh, and over the course of the first four weeks, we've generated about sixty four thousand impressions in total. So hey, it's sixty five thousand more impressions than we would have had if we hadn't done this. And I, it's not to say we can't do better and and reach more audiences, but I feel I feel good about the progress we've made so far, and we're hopeful we'll get more more allies to sign on. That's all I got. Any questions? Thank you so much for doing the work. Very much appreciate yep. your extra work. Sure. Um, are there any comments or questions for Doug on this? Matt, go ahead. Yeah, just thank you. That's incredible that you've gotten to the level of detail of knowing who did what and how many. <laughs> you know, we need more of that. That's very good. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, anyone else? Any public comment? Okay, RJ is making a comment showing us a fish that's probably undersized, but that's all right. We'll just move on. Maybe I'll get him to talk. Um, okay, we'll move to the minutes. Um, approval of minutes from November 14th, 2023. Uh, has everybody read them? Um, um, Peter, I had a, a correction I had to offer. Okay. Uh, I overlooked when I submitted the 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 minutes. I overlooked uh, a sentence under number eight when we were discussing the survey. Uh, I didn't complete the sentence, so I was going to suggest to Leah that she revise it when she's back to the, her desk. I'm sure she'll get to it, but it's a, a line that should read: "After discussion and minor wording changes, committee consensus was to move forward with the survey." I think I I just. I had the idea, but I didn't write it down. So anyway, that's what that was about. Otherwise, uh, I was good with it, obviously, because I wrote it. Can you send that um, to Leah, what you just said? Will do. Okay. RJ, did you have something to say? Just for the record, Chair, I did not keep that fish. I released that one. It was short. Thank you. All right. That's fine. <laughs> um, all right. So um, I will take a motion. Um on these minutes, November 14th, 2023. Move approval. It's Matt. Uh, thanks, Matt. Take a, a second. Is that you, Gary? Second, yep. Second by Gary. Okay, roll call vote. Uh, Doug Rose. Aye. Jen Carberg. Aye. Gary Beller. Aye. Joanna Roach. Aye. Sarah Boyce. Aye. Rachel Freeman. Aye. Christy Kickham. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. Chair votes aye. Okay. Uh, new business committee and natural resources department reports from planning board, CONCOM, Harbor and Shelters Advisory Board, Select Board, um, Advisory Committee on Non-Voting Taxpayers, and other committee members. Do we have any reports from you guys? Okay. Um, Leah well, wanted me to tell you that the uh, Worcester Poly Technic Polytechnic Institute um, is doing their presentation today at 1 p.m. in the community room. And of particular note, there's a coastal resilience project report at 1.10 to 1.30. I'm going to go to that. You aren't required, but if you have the time and you're interested, then definitely go and support them, hear what they got to say. Um, and then um, you probably got something um, in your packet or got an email about um, the NOAA historic storm tracking mapping tool. And there's a link for it. Vince is going to walk us through that. He's also going to um, update us on Massachusetts, um, the Massachusetts Resilient Coasts CRDs. The state of Massachusetts is uh, finally getting on board, catching up and um, creating coastal resilience districts around the state. And Vince will do those two items for us. Go ahead, Vince. Thank you, Peter. And can everyone see the shared screen now? Yeah. Yes. So when you click on the link that's in the packet, you land right here. I'm just going to walk us through it so we can all do it. There we go. Later, just type in Nantucket, click on it, and give it a second. So when you open this up, I by the way, I should say I stumbled across this 
uh, when I found a reference in a different state report, went and instantly found it. And it, once you type in Nantucket and gets you to here, um, there's a couple of things to look at. First, uh, there's a whole bunch of colored lines and this circle around it. That's a 60 mile circle, a 60 nautical mile circle. You can change that to whatever distance, but any storm since records began in the, I think, 1830s or so, um, that came within that range of Nantucket, uh, which is our area of interest, that will show up. Um, there's a couple of nice ones. I like the one for Storm Esther that uh, gave us the name for Esther's Island on Smith Point. Um, but you can play with this. You can refine the number of years from 2010 to 2020 or whatever the time frame you're interested in. You can go through one, five, 10, 50 year time frames, whatever you're interested in. You can change the um, the distance and you can get much closer to Nantucket. 60 is just the default. You can change that out to a couple of hundred. Um, and then other information. So if you're looking for specific storm category types, and let's just quickly see, was there ever a Cat 5? near Nantucket, one got close, a couple got close, they stayed lit up. Anyway, so you can get the idea, you can just walk through this, play with this, uh, change the distances, change the storm categories, um, edit it, see what you're interested in, and um, refine it. A handful have had direct hits on Nantucket over time, and you can find those by literally changing the distance right into, say, oh, I don't know, five. And then you can see the ones that are much closer that have had more direct impacts on us and the years that they uh, were here. So uh, another nice tool that I recently stumbled across, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, any questions before I move on? Yeah, I get a question. Is there a tool or can you manipulate this tool to give us the, the trajectories of nor'easters going back? Since those are the things that we usually get more of an impact on, more direct impacts. If they're named storms, I imagine they're part of this already. I haven't dug into that. Let me check that one, Peter. That's a real good question. I mean, just we all know what, you know, mm -hmm. we've already had several nor'easters and we all know they last two, three days. And we know that the winds get up to around, can get up to around 90. And they, they I know a nor'easter is anything that's sustained winds of 40 miles per hour or higher over two or three days and rain, wind, snow, all of, our, all of us that have had to endure uh, experiences with what goes on on the east end of the island uh, without me actually naming the entity know that the nor'easters are you know a big part of that so um, you know yeah. the hurricanes affect us on the south shore I would say on the west shore the most the nor'easters you know when we get a real rager of a nor'easter you can go to the east shore or the north shore and see what the damage is and then you can go to the south shore and see what looks like a calm sea because it's not getting it. So nor'easters would be a great thing to have a something like this. Anyway, that's my thought. Yeah. Um, a good question. It doesn't seem to be part of this, honestly. Um, just looking at it in a very basic way, um, just looking at what information is in here, like they're all hurricanes. And when you look at the categories that are available, it's all hurricanes, tropical storms, tropical depressions, and extrapolations from historics. So it seems to be very much focused on hurricanes. Let me see if I can dig up something for you um, or get a better answer on the nor'easters because I'm interested too. Okay, let's hear about the uh, resilient coasts thing. Sweet. So um, this was a lot of fun. Uh, we were, con sorry, I'll start at the start. Libby was contacted, the town manager was contacted by the office of CZM. Um, and Libby naturally asked that, um, Leah and I be part of the meeting once she found out the purpose, which is to understand what Nantucket is doing for coastal resilience districts. The, the thing is, this is a new state pro program that just got underway in November, and it's going to be about a two year program, if I remember rightly. We were the first community that the that CZM decided to meet with. And just to show you their level of interest in us, it was the new director and deputy director that were part of the meeting. They were interested in, and the program director for their coastal resilience districts. That's how much of an impression we've made, just so that everyone's aware. Um, it was quite surreal. Um, so essentially, they wanted they they were somewhat aware that we were also working in coastal resilience districts, and they explained what their new program is. 
and it quite quickly turned out that it's actually very different to what we're looking at. Exactly the same name, but very different purposes. They're looking at every one of the 78 coastal communities in the state, and they want to undertake this thing called coastal resilience districts, but looking at it in terms of risk assessment. They're not looking for solutions. They're just trying to understand coastal risk. We've already done that. Nantucket as a community in the CRP, the first six months in, we had the existing conditions and risk assessment document. That covered it. We went on a stage further and looked at solutions. The state is looking at the, you know, the macro level, understanding the coastal risk throughout the state. And then they're going to look at possible solutions later, but they want to understand the risk first. So this is where there's this unusual juxtaposition between uh, the municipality and the state government. We're using the same uh, um, name for very different things. And the town's version, as you guys discussed over the summer into September, is for a funding model. That's what our coastal resilience districts are, is a funding model for um, how to pay for coastal resilience programs and projects around the island. So it's the same name, but used in very different ways. So we did discuss briefly how could we differentiate and just say coastal resilience districts for risk assessment or coastal resilience districts for um, project funding. So we're already kind of kicking that one around. And then to, uh, I know Doug has a question and I, I, I promise I'll stop in a second, but to give an update where the, where we are, um, I have uh, been working with Arcadis and KP Law uh, to draft something for, uh, that'll be ready in the next couple of weeks. It's not ready, um, not even, it, it'll be ready in December or early January at the latest. Uh, that would be part of a warrant article um, for town meeting in May. And that's how the coast resilience districts here will work. Now, there's going to be a lot of process in this. I'm quite certain that this is going to come to this committee for plenty of review. That's one of my hopes. But one of the things that we have to be aware of that it's now in process. And once we get some text and it will go to um, uh, the finance committee for review and all this kind of things, it is now going to be part of the town meeting um, uh, juggernaut that it is. So I want to try and get some review from this committee at some point, hopefully, but I'm in this unusual position with timing. I need to get text to town admin as quickly as I can. Hopefully I get something to you guys too. Fingers crossed. Okay, Vince, thanks. Doug, go ahead. Yeah, real quick, the the article I think that Leah had forwarded to us about the, the statewide project was very exciting to me in the sense that it not only was interested in us in doing a risk assessment uh, for all the coastal communities, but it, as I understood it also called for statewide cooperative grant applications. So rather than each individual community competing with the, with the others, uh, Massachusetts could go forward or, or, or certain districts within Massachusetts, like the Cape and Islands might be able to cooperate on a much larger scale for, for federal funding and, and whatnot. So is that, is, am I, is my understanding correct on that, Vince? Yes, when we asked questions about that, that wasn't so well fleshed out. Um, so I wasn't 100% certain on how to bring it here to comment on. But it's it's certainly part of their description, but I'm, I'm struggling to understand it, honestly. Rachel, go ahead. Thank you, Peter. Um, Vince, I had a question. I, this is just really exciting, first of all. I think it's super cool, so thank you. Um, I guess one thing that I'm wondering about is when do, do things like coastal resilience districts start um, including zoning? Like what's the right order of operations? You know, that you, we develop this and then how does it start incorporating zoning and planning? And, you know, will these be available to, to be included in local regulations? Um, will, there, will there be an avenue for that going forward? Thank you. Yeah. Peter, if I can. Vince. Thank you. So, yes, um, not 100% certain on that one either. This is still in development. But it kind of gets back to the question that Matt brought up much earlier in a different topic about um, do we do it as betterments or uh, is it done through a town bylaw or as a home rule petition? And so the way that this is being developed um, per the committee's recommendation was that the uh, bylaw and home rule petition are the two bits that are going for a town meeting. And we're still trying to better understand the potential application of the betterment system. 
as it stands without any changes so that we can potentially, as Matt says, get on with a few projects um, under the existing system, you know, without having to wait, essentially. So because there's three parts to it, uh, Rachel, um, and the most likely one to proceed from town meeting is the one for the town bylaw, I don't know yet but it'll have to be in concert with all the existing uh, um, zoning bylaws if because they're already on the books, they're on statutes. So we'll have to take those into account. Altering those, um, that's probably zoning board of appeal question. Thank you. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I'm, con I'm very concerned about us going right to the zoning and the town meeting and everything else. I, you know, I wanna know what can we do with the existing law? And if if we can get as much as I think we can get done done, then I think we we shouldn't <laughs> be wasting time this year or next year on uh, on something that is going to be contentious and <laughs> will slow us down. And so anyway, I, I think you know I'd like to make sure that town council has looked into it. Sometimes it's easy to just say, oh, we'll do it in the future and push something out a forward that's going to take years and years. And then we're stuck in, in, in no man's land. I think we really need to see what can we do now with what we have now, kind of like what RJ is talking about with ConCom. What do they have ability to do now? Let's do it, you know, rather than, you know, placate a segment of the island and, and push it off for 10 years. So anyway, I, I hope that we push on that to make sure it isn't a delay tactic. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Gary, go ahead. Uh, I assume, thinking about what Matt just said, but the town has already done betterments over the years. So I think we have a process in place which has been used in the past and that the town can continue to use going forward currently until we have some better knowledge of what the coastal resilient districts are. But my understanding is that we've used betterments in the town in the past and therefore we should be able to continue using that model and keep doing that to the stuff that we have to get done right away and to the extent the crds get approved then we'll have another option thanks gary christy uh peter i have a few capital committee items so when we're done with this before we move off this line this item just uh come back to me um why don't you just go go ahead Okay. This, is the, this is our last last item other than you know a journey so and we've got 10 more minutes if we want to stay on schedule okay really quickly um and maybe it's these are three youth events um but uh two the two items for funding this year that came up in our capital committee meeting that uh had a good amount of discussion um uh there's the uh strategic uh retreat and re uh, relocation program uh, committee and myself, to some extent, had a little trouble finding out um, from the description uh, in the Rory what uh, what exactly the funding, how the funding is working, um, because and it came up in the meeting that you know isn't this perfect funding to be drawn from from the that sort of million dollar uh, 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 CRP funding? So Vince, if you get a chance, I just wanted to see if you could maybe either email me so I could share with the committee some clarification on how that um, maybe 250,000 might be used and, and how it might differ from sort of the general funding um, best you can. Yeah, um, if I can, Peter. Um, well, you, you don't have to do it now, Ben, so you can get it to him. In a, in yeah, a... sure. So yeah. Have to be now. Just, I just have just... one simple point on that one. Yeah. I hate to say it these ways. But um, I wrote a scope for that. I sent it to Leah. I don't know if she's edited it, but we can get you that scope. That'd be great. And I'll share that with the committee. Um, that'd be helpful. And then the only other, the other one was the uh, Folger Marsh Bridge uh, uh, design and permitting, um, uh, which I supported thoroughly. Uh, and But I think uh, when we look at the um, CRP, it looks like the implement, implementation date is not till 2035. Does that sound right? Um, and just maybe some clarification on the distance between this funding and actually in implementation. Um, 
personally, I think this is considering that we've had some uh, um, breaching uh, at that area, I would love to see this project moved up. Um, I, I think considering the cost, which I think was around 20 or 21 million um, is very significant, but uh, it's a significant portal on the island. Um, and I think that we really need to find that year that maybe there aren't, we aren't doing a DPW campus or a, an Our Island home to sort of wedge that in to try to get that done sooner. But I would love to see that and um, um, Saka Japan, I, uh, those two items moved up in the Im implementation. That's all I got. Thank you. I can, if I can, Peter? Yes, Vince. Thank you. So um, I hate to say it in these kind of terms. Um, a lot of these projects I've passed off to Leah and I'm not up enough to give an answer, but she's the one leading the, the, the that project now um, and it's hers to carry forward. Um, but I'm aware that she's been moving on it. She's trying to get it going. And I have been trying to support her in that effort. I do know that the DPW is also involved and they're looking at um, how they can carry that project forward in some way. But to be perfectly frank, this is something that Leah needs to update the committee on. I also am sorry to say that I think that the collision study was something that she was going to, to talk about today. Um, it's something that was presented to the select board at one point that mm. there's a huge number of large projects all coming along at the same time and this will be one of them potentially so we need to understand you know uh to quote town manager how can we do a bridge when our island home needs to be done yeah all right thank yeah. you Vincent. thanks christy matt go ahead yeah just you know along those lines I'm actually on the wind committee that spoke earlier. Um, you know, in my head, I'm trying to think whether I, you know, step down from there or step or just recuse from here or there, depending, you know, when we get to that point. But one thing struck me from our conversation with that group is, and, and it's it's striking me now about with, with some of these things that two years ago, we said, let's get these done right away. And now we're pushing them out 10 years or, you know, we'll have to find out from Leah. We're pushing them out quite a bit. I think that we, the priority is going to have, it has to shift at some point from studies and discussions and interviewing people and everything to implementation. What have we done? Who's done it? And we've done a good job of tracking that. But I think as a committee, we, you know, we need to start finding a way to spend, you know, a certain segment of our time, a third, a half, whatever on, you know, what are the steps we need to get these implemented and, and how do we do that? Because if we don't start that, I don't think anyone else is going to advocate for it. They're going to advocate for their own department. They're going to advocate for other things, but we are going to have to advocate for coastal resiliency. And so I think that we need to spend more time on advocating for things that should be done now in priority sooner. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Christy, you got more? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, you know, uh, what better way to, um, you know, show the public what's down the pipeline is in the way of funding is getting things moving right now. But uh, we also know when you wait on a project every year, it's going to go up significantly. And, um, you know, if we were to wait for this Folger Bridge till mid 2030s, then it's going to be twice, twice the cost. Uh, and we could actually use it sooner than later. So um, anyway, something for us to discuss, and, and I'm sure Leah will provide some uh, enlightenment. Thank you. Okay, any more questions or comments from the committee? All right. Um, discussion of upcoming meeting dates and topics. The next meeting is January 9th, 2024. Um, and uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Matt Fee. Second by who? Joanna. Joanna, okay. Um, so roll call vote. Christy Kickham. Aye. Doug Rose. Aye. Jen Carberg. Aye. Gary Beller. Sarah Boyce. Can't hear you, Gary. You got your Gary's thing. Muted. Aye from Sarah. I said aye, but I also think we also wish Leah a quick recovery from her COVID. 
I will pass that on and you guys um, text her individually for sure. Um, Rachel Freeman. Aye. Joanna Roach. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. Chair votes aye. Everybody have a great Christmas and New Year's. Sure, I'll see you around before, before it all, but thanks for a great meeting. Really appreciate it. <laughs>